least likely to be concerned with function, program, or even structure in certain cases. Um, in many cases, technique is not employed to solve problems that exist, but rather somewhat trapped in a tautology, it's often used for solving problems that are invented and brought to the program. I think that these trends are associated with you know, a lot of really important work, needless to say. But in lesser work, I think it threatens to make architecture at times irrelevant eventually. And, and at worst, its evaluation reduced to subjective discussions of beauty and so on. The work that Constance Adams has done designing space stations and vehicles for NASA and now with Lockheed Martin Space Operations Company represents perhaps the extreme opposite of some of these trends. Her work is instructive precisely because of the extremity of its context. Designing for microgravity and limited by the unbelievable expense of putting every additional ounce of material into space, one's contribution as an architect for those kinds of conditions simply cannot be about expression in many senses of the word. It can, however, be about something from which many of us have become very distant. The idea that architecture can operate at the meeting place of pure engineering and industrial design by asserting its unique agenda for synthesis of functional, social, and cultural values. It is futurist work in the true sense, not futuristic. It is optimistic, but by necessity intensely pragmatic. It represents just the very beginning of architecture's voice in a domain thought to be exclusive to engineers and rocket scientists. It is, however, an important beginning. I first knew Constance when, I was, uh, when she was a couple years ahead of me at Yale. She was one of those people uh, the school seemed to have a bunch of at the time, skeptical, worldly in realms far outside of architecture, fiercely smart, and as the holder of a liberal arts degree from Harvard, probably a little bit overeducated. One specific memory I have of her was that the final review of a studio that, was in the, that Frank Gehry taught with, a, uh, with collaborations of four students from the School of Art and four students from the School of Architecture. I remember Constance at the review behind a veil of smoke, you could smoke at the a and in those days, which is amazing, critically surveying the proceedings. She seemed a thousand miles away. Please welcome Constance Adams. Wow, Tim, thanks a lot. That was um, actually an amazingly insightful idea um, in that introduction. And uh, by way of locating this moment that we're at, I hope that, um, I'm not sure, I noticed that there's juries going on. I hope the charretting isn't over because around midnight tonight, the moon will set and anybody who looks out at the sky will be aware of the fact that around now the Earth is passing on its orbit through the constellation of Leo into a cloud of debris. Um, and so from about midnight tonight until dawn you will see, I think it's safe to say literally billions and billions of shooting stars. Um, even in Los Angeles, there's enough of them that even in LA you'll probably see a whole lot of shooting stars. So um, it's a pretty good night to talk about space. Um, and and the, I was actually amused in a way to think about this talk in the context of, of make it new. Um, because one of the struggles I had at Yale was that I'm a person deeply of the conviction that there is nothing new under the sun, nothing really new. And here's everybody trying to do new stuff, um, which I thought was sort of a mistake in that the only real ways to innovate, in my point of view, are, are two, either you can interpret in a novel way an existing paradigm, um, or, and this is not really something architects typically do, you can uh, work on the breakthrough development of some new technology or material that more accurately meets old needs and therefore in doing that lends to the innovation of new ones. So um, ironically enough, I ended up pursuing a career which has almost proven myself wrong. Because um, if anything can be new, TransHab would be it. And TransHab is a spacecraft I'm going to talk about a little bit more towards the end of this talk. Um, but it has met both of the criteria, at least, that I've set for new. Um, 
and also represents a very different view of a vehicle for exploration than anything that's come before, like the Beagle or the Endeavor or a covered wagon or a yurt. Um, and at the same time adapts the communal home paradigm to the environment of outer space. From the engineer's point of view, it's more important that it represents a novel approach to structural design and combines more than one technical and material innovation into a vehicle which has so far yielded two patents for the structures team and will almost certainly bring two or three more. So maybe almost nothing is really new. Um, but it's possible to innovate, to reinterpret, and even to make, to take a new perspective on the stuff that we've been working on for a long time and to make it novel. And these things, in fact, can be done. The hard part, um, I think, is, and, and the noble part is not making it new, um, it's making it work. And that's uh, maybe a challenge that. Um, we should think about taking on a little bit more consciously sometimes. Um, just over a fortnight ago, some 60 architects and designers who are expert in aviation and human spaceflight came from all over the world to Houston for the first World Space Architecture Symposium. One of them is here in the front row tonight, David Nixon. Um, when I first came to work at the Johnson Space Center, one of the things that I was sort of given to look at was a series of studies he did at SciArc. Um, in the mid-80s for uh, outfitting of the International Space Station and his studio did really good work. There's a lot of crap out there, but uh, Nixon's studio is one of the few that did some really nice stuff. So um, somebody it's great to have here. The symposium culminated in a workshop that produced the first document of our profession which we call the Millennium Charter for Space Architecture. And according to this charter, Space architecture is the theory and practice of designing and building inhabited environments in outer space. All architecture is space architecture. Terrestrial architecture is just the specialized subset with which we are most familiar. It's a question of scale and of philosophy and a question which shifts the relationship between architecture and the human being into the foreground of design discourse. Not just architecture and the human being, but architecture and the cosmos, and I'm not overstating the case. But for the purposes of the talk tonight and in general, the most important single thing to remember is that as we move out beyond our planet, our perspective on ourselves is made fundamentally new, and it involves a real dissolution of our perspective on ourselves and of our ideologies and our territory. The spacefarer's image of our world is as a system, intertwined and complex, fragile and freewheeling. But viewing humanity as a system has certain consequences, and these reflect themselves in design. Now I'm going to see how this works. It doesn't. Uh-oh. Um, they're not synced up. Ah, oh, here we go. Great, thank you. The picture over here on the left is probably the symbolic image of our time. Earthrise over the moon was taken on the Apollo 8 mission on Christmas Eve, and it showed us all for the first time very clearly what was our home and may represent better than any other the profound change in collective consciousness brought by, bought by our first decade as a space-faring species. And when that image was new, our idea of the future was informed by Star Trek, which well-ordered, it was a multiracial kind of world where Earthlings moved forward into the galaxy, and this advanced itself on its own, didn't it? Close enough. Um, <laughs> the future was viewed as basically powerful and benign, and our relationship with our technology was a benign one in which we were in control of what we were making. Um, and incidentally, we had solved all of what we considered to be our social problems and our basic political and economic problems um, in a very forward thinking way. These were images that, of course, represented dreams and, and very forward-thinking dreams at that time. And like any ideas, they were very powerful ones. 
The question is, how did that ordered and progressive future that we envisioned for ourselves in the 60s devolve into the kind of technology terror that we're experiencing now and have for the last 10 years or so? Consider the dreams of the future that followed Star Trek, 2001, Blade Runner, RoboCop, Terminator, and The Matrix. In each of these, humans experience progressively less control over our technology and social order decays into chaos. I suspect the dominant theoretical model for social evolution has then shifted to a kind of technological determinism, which implies that we're controlled by our creations to an ever-increasing degree. Think of HAL 9000, the archetypal object of techno-fear. Our relationship with our machines makes us nervous, uncertain as to our physical relationship to the things we make. Blade Runner and RoboCop both treat the problems of biotechnology and cyborgs, the moral and physical terror of the direct human-machine interface in a world which shows growing physical deterioration, violence, and chaos. The future images of the 1990s no longer confine their setting to a megalopolis, but to total planetary collapse. It appears that it's now all but impossible for us in our day and age to envision a landscape of the future which is healthful or life-sustaining. The true culmination of this trend in Terminator and The Matrix show us a future of utter violence and desperation in which the few remnants of humanity huddle in bunkers to fend off machines. How did we lose our sense of control over the future? I find it interesting in my current profession to think about the bad guy in Terminator, who of course isn't a bad guy, he's a really good guy, and he's a really good engineer. But he does what a good engineer does, which is to pursue his task without reflecting on the sort of moral niceties or other sides of it um, until it's complete. I find it very interesting, for example, to work in the aerospace world where the engineers say the devil's in the details. Um, unlike Michelangelo, who thought that it was God that lived there. Um, but backtracking, oversight, interface, um, checking all of the systems against each other is just not how engineers are trained to work. In fact, they are specialists and they are trained to pursue their task and to optimize their system. But the whole, the harmony of the whole is of course threatened if every system is optimized, right? That makes sense if you think about it that way. But architects are really the only people anymore who are trained as generalists in the kind of way that sets us up from the very beginning to see God in the deep, to look for God in the details and to to set um, our goals around harmony. It's our job to track complex and non-related systems to direct them toward a unified goal. The balancing of conflicting tendencies is our goal so that harmony may be affected and its center the human being. A rigorous understanding must be maintained in architecture of the appropriate scale for each maneuver, the appropriate operation of each system, and the appropriate application of the entire project. Such wildly disparate elements as steel and cushions and grass must be understood in themselves and in their capacities and balanced against one another to produce the human habitat. And their different meanings encompass between them a world of significance about building and the human body and soul. In my design process, this multiplicity expresses itself as a kind of duality, which respects on the one hand the functions of metabolism, which are essential to any construction or indeed any process that exists in nature, like structure, circulation, exchange of energy or food or nutrient or fluids. The other half of that duality is the choreographic idea, one which expresses an understanding of phases and transitions, of rituals and habits and time. Architectural choreography is a process of defining form based on the divination of individual and social patterns. Nowhere is the need for diligent balance of these categories greater than in design of technology that supports a human-machine interface, particularly the design of spacecraft and off-planet facilities. After all, this machine serves as the total environment for the crew, and it's no simple task to see to it that this is a universally positive experience. For some years, NASA 
has been refining procedures for what we call usability testing or human engineering of hardware and procedures that are used in aircraft and space facilities. But the human engineer is always working in a reactive mode rather than a proactive one and always only on one piece of hardware at a time. Thus, in contrast to the holistic concurrent process, which is traditional to design and architecture, the integration of the vehicle with its support systems is still a job that tends to take place after the fact, rather than from the outset of mission or vehicle design. I was working on one competition for the crew return vehicle just a year and a half ago, um, maybe two years ago now at this point. And I remember looking at a uh, test article that was under construction. It was supposed to be flown in an actual test in two months. And there were still engineers in there taping wires inside the vehicle. I tried to get um, diagrams of what were you know, the basic life support systems, engineering systems, um, electrical, pyrotechnics. And there just weren't answers yet. They were still working it out. And, um, that's just a very classic example of the kind of environment in which we're working. And no matter how wonderful the machine, I'm always trying to tell people, no matter how wonderful it is, its level of success or failure depends 100% on its ability to support an efficient and productive on-orbit team. That's something, in, sort of a new idea. But in human spaceflight, it really is true. The space hermetic habitat poses tremendous hurdles to metabolic integration. Its constraints of volume, power, and mass are really punishing. It costs about $22,000 to launch one kilo of mass into low Earth orbit. And thus, it's really impossible to introduce any element that is not absolutely essential. It also demands the most rigorous kind of attention to choreography in that human survival depends on the crew's fundamental well-being in an environment which offers none of the ingredients essential to human life. The challenges of keeping a crew productive and healthy in a non-Earth environment are tremendous. Without gravity, our vestibular and circulatory systems don't work very well. Above the Earth's protective atmosphere and magnetosphere, we're subject to tremendous doses of radiation. And even within the magnetic shield up in the stratosphere, only a few tested materials have proven to be effective shields against charged particles like atomic oxygen. Over the 41 years of human spaceflight, are those supposed to be there? Okay. Over the 41 years of human spaceflight, the task of integration on any vehicle has always fallen to somebody called the chief engineer. In the early days, this work primarily centered around the incredible challenge of simply making human spaceflight a reality and guaranteeing that each mission was survivable. The success of the early missions is in no small part due to a process of risk mitigation which NASA developed. Um, I got to learn, I had the very unusual um, opportunity to learn about risk mitigation pretty much at first hand when TransHab um, had been under development for about two and a half years. The project got to a point when we were able to undergo um, a technical independent assessment, which meant we spent three days in a room with the men who had been the chief engineers on every project from the X-15 through the space shuttle. Um, one of these guys actually celebrated his 83rd birthday on the third day of this meeting, and yet um, we were not able to finish a single sentence without their tearing us apart. So um, it was a pretty interesting, it made, it made any jury that I've ever sat in feel like, you know, a, a ride in the park. And, um, but they taught us a lot and they told us some amazing stories. One of them was a story about bolts. Bolts. Um, as you may know, uh, most spacecraft that have been flown so far are basically uh, hogged out of a solid piece of aluminum so as to reduce risk. In other words, there aren't any wells or there are as few wells as possible because um, analyzing the structural integrity of a weld is, is really not a very hard science. Um, so they want to make sure that that's reduced. And you've all heard the story about um, no windows in the first mercury capsule and the crew insisting that there be a window. And the problem with the window is um, you have seals and you have to make those seals work and you're, you're sealing two different materials to one another which are going to react differently in a 500 degree temperature spread which is what the spacecraft experiences up on orbit. So they hate the windows. I can understand why but we really need them. Well obviously you need bolts to hold together these pieces 
um, that are really not going to fail. And so they figured out what size of bolt they were going to need. But they didn't then just order bolts in that size. They went and found out who manufactured these particular bolts. And they checked the failure rate of everything produced by each of the manufacturers. And then they that being the case, they narrowed it down to a couple of um, different possibilities. And they went and asked what mines the ores came from that they used to produce their metals. And then they went and visited the mines and they checked um, the purity of the loads that were being dug at that point in time and what the failure rate was on absolutely everything that had ever been made with ore from that mine. And that pretty much narrowed it down to one supplier for the bolts. Um, but that's risk mitigation because every single element has inside of it buried risk. Right? And so what you do is you dig down every single place where there could be a failure and you just hammer it down to as close to zero as possible. Um, and that's the only acceptable way to build a spacecraft. Unfortunately, in all of these decades, there has never been anything like the same kind of focus on reducing the risk in the human system. For example, the Gemini capsule from which the first American EVA or extravehicular activity was taken um, didn't have any handrails on the outside. So uh, the astronaut couldn't really climb back in. He had to use his tether to pull himself back inside, which is, um, it was almost a pretty big problem, but they figured that one out. Anyone who's seen the next generation Apollo capsule or its Soviet counterpart, the Vostok module, would agree that sharing this tiny volume with two other people is almost unthinkable, even if it is just for a short week and you're on your way to the moon. But basically, prior to the phase one shuttle Mir missions, um, which began in 1995, Skylab Experiment M483 represented America's sole experience with missions of duration greater than a fortnight. The longest of these, Skylab 4, lasted only 84 days. Despite this, the Skylab missions have provided us with our most substantial database of experience and astronaut feedback, and it basically has formed our principal guidelines to creating rules for good space design. Here you have a Saturn 1B rocket, which is a smaller version of what then becomes a Saturn 5. The bottom two stages there um, are the ones that get you up to a nice high orbit. The third stage um, was what we called the TLI stage, translunar injection. That's what you needed to get to the moon. Obviously, if Congress has killed your lunar program uh, uh, several missions early and you've got some spare rockets floating around that don't need to go to the moon, then you don't need to fill that third stage with propellant. So the idea was, okay, we've got these extra rockets. We'll just use this third stage as a space station. We can shoot it up there and, and use it for a little while, and then it will come down. So that's, that's Skylab. There you go. Um, one of the nice things about uh, the particular kind of propellant used is, that of course, you've got two separate tanks, one for hydrogen and one for oxygen. Um, so that lower round tank down there would have, would have held liquid oxygen. Instead, it just was in a vacuum. And the little tiny red thing you see was um, a, a tiny, tiny airlock that they used for trash. So the oxygen tank is just where all the garbage went. So that didn't, because, you know, you don't throw it out the window when you're in space because anything that's out there is liable to come back at you at 17,000 miles an hour, which is sort of prohibitive. Um, I've got some great shots of cracks in the, in the space shuttle's windshield from little bits of space debris that hit them. and Those have been problems. Um, so what they did at the, at the Marshall Space Flight Center where they build rockets was decide to outfit the interior. And first they just started putting stuff any old which way because they said, hey, you know, what difference does it make? There's no up and down. Um, and then the Raymond Lowy office sort of got involved with Skylab at at a point which is still a little unclear to me in the development process and said, look, you've got to make some of it at least a little bit rational. So the lower area you see down there is what they call the crew quarters. Um, and it all had a consistent local vertical. In other words, in any one area, there was just one sense of up and down because guess what? As, as fun as it might seem to be to be without gravity, we actually evolved with gravity. Um, our whole sense of perception in the world is related to a counterpoint to the gravity vector. 
Um, and without it, in fact, people tend to feel rather ill and are, are pretty unproductive. And at least we were able to prove that with Skylab, the fact that it was partly any old which way and partly with a consistent up and down uh, ended up being very helpful to, um, to the generation of basic requirements for human space flight. There were all kinds of interesting things about Skylab from which we learned a lot. The two floors in the crew quarters that you sort of saw in the previous cutaway were, um, were just made of an open aluminum grill work. Um, six and a half meters in diameter, and yet I have to tell you, each one of those floors only weighs 50 pounds. Uh, so it's pretty nice light stuff. The idea was that the air system would simply flow right through, right? So you wouldn't want to have to f um, block air. Air has to move a lot when you have no gravity, because without gravity there's no convection. Hot air doesn't rise. Cold air doesn't fall. There's no reason for air to move at all unless you're pushing it. So for example, if you stay in one place for a long time, and you'll end up with a carbon dioxide bubble around your face, right, if there's no air moving. Um, little details like that become really, really important. The idea was also that this floor could be used as a restraint system that they would put on these boots that they would lace on every morning that had this really groovy cleat on the sole. And you could hold yourself in place by putting your foot in that, in that grid work and, and turning, right, turning the cleat. Except there's this one little thing about every action having an equal and opposite reaction. And if I put my foot against this floor and I, I push, before I've gotten to turn the cleat and click myself in, I'm up there. So also, try lacing up boots underwater. In other words, putting on things like shoes and lacing them when you're without gravity takes 15 minutes, half an hour. It's a huge waste of time and energy. And the crew just didn't put them on. They stopped wearing them. To this day, crews wear socks. You know, that's all they need. So um, another one of those learning lessons. Here we go. Um, this is one of, uh, this is the really groovy Raymond Lowy table um, that had some cool pieces. See something wrong with the height of the table? Anybody? Um, without gravity, you are basically in what we call neutral body posture, which is sort of like a dead man's float. The knees are slightly bent, um, the, head, the, the body kips forward a little bit, the arms want to be like this. And basically, if you are going to prevent the crew from getting weird cramps and working really hard to do simple, ordinary, easy tasks, you need to design around that posture. There's no sitting versus standing, for example. If their feet are restrained at the floor, then the table needs to be at least a foot higher than an ordinary table on Earth. Um, but of course, we didn't know that until the crew was struggling desperately to get the food in their mouths. Um, so those are always good pictures. Here we go. Water. Water without gravity floats. And water has its own minute gravitic force. The more of it there is, the larger it wants to be. The more water collects to the original water, it forms a ball. By the time water is about the size of a baseball, um, it has so much surface tension that you can hold a vacuum tube right to it, and all it does is spin. It doesn't go in. Um, so it really is a force to be reckoned with. If you try to shower in space, you get these little water droplets, and of course they're everywhere. And the crew would take maybe a two minute shower and then they'd spend 40 minutes running around trying to vacuum up all of the water that they'd showered. Um, so you can imagine how many times they did that. Um, they actually, the Russians built a shower, or it was called a sauna, but it's sort of a steam shower on Mir. And um, it was unused for a really long time and finally they got sick of it and they took a machete, <laughs> hacked it out so they could use the space for storage anyway. Um, it's really refreshing working with the Russians. Their attitudes are very different. Um, sweat is also a form of water, and what it does is float. It doesn't drip off of your forehead, it drips out. So, on the other hand, exercise is something that so far is the only 
even remotely effective countermeasure that we've discerned to the body's natural tendency to use up things that aren't being used. So for example, since my, my muscles and my skeleton were designed to actuate specific activities in counterpoint to gravity, without gravity I don't need nearly as much of that and my body starts metabolizing itself. Um, so the cosmonaut Polyakov, for example, who was stuck on Mir um, during you know, the collapse of the Soviet Union for 14 months, um, isn't someone you ever see. He never makes public appearances. Um, his heart is in very bad condition. He's lost enough of his hip mass that um, it probably won't ever be replaced by the body. So these are th very serious issues. Um, and one of the reasons that we have a space station today, one of the pieces of science that we're working on very, very hard, is learning to understand the human body and trying to figure out what kinds of countermeasures there might be. Sleep is an interesting thing. Without gravity, it's not really all that peaceful just to float. In fact, it's really uncomfortable. And if you think about it, one of the nicest things about sleeping is kind of lying in a soft bed and having a blanket on top of you. But those aren't feelings that you have when you don't have gravity. So um, the crew end up preferring <laughs> these sort of you know, straight jacket-like um, contraptions whereby they can strap themselves to the wall. You see he's got a band around his head because otherwise your, your, your head ends up bobbing in the air currents, right? So um, another great thing that we were able to do on Skylab um, was test the idea of basically a kind of controllable jet pack that astronauts could wear when they go EVA um, as a kind of backup security system. So just in case they should break loose of some kind of tether or hold, they can maneuver their way around. Um, despite what Hollywood would have us believe, you cannot use them to surf Mars. But, um, but they did, they were able to test them in the, the large volume of the workshop in Skylab, and it's really amusing to read the um, transcripts from those sessions. I'm going, whoa, there it is. And the other, the main point of Skylab, in theory, um, not from our point of view, but from NASA's point of view, was to learn about the sun. And we did, we learned a lot about the um, patterns of the sun and um, basically laid the groundwork for uh, the current trend of solar science. But um, until 1995, that was the longest um, experience that Americans had in space. And then we uh, made an understanding with the Russian space program, well, we'd already made that understanding, and that we were going into joint venture in a space station. And so we started sending American astronauts to Mir. The Mir base block. Um, was originally designed in 1974 as the Salyut-6 capsule. Um, and these drawings have never been redone. In fact, the exact same module is the core of the International Space Station right now, the service module. Um, and somebody designed it, and it never got redesigned. I've interviewed a lot of cosmonauts about you know, what they consider to be um, preferable ways of accommodating certain activities in space. And I think the, the first issue we always have with interviews is they say, what difference does it make, what I think? Um, you know, it's all politics. It doesn't matter anyway. And they're more right than I would like to think, you know, even in America. But um, here you see uh, astronaut Norm Thagard in a Cayuta, which is one of their sleep compartments. What you see right beyond him is a window. Um, that's their, you know, the own, their personal private window and a sleep compartment whereby they can look at the earth or get one hell of a sunburn in 30 seconds um, of unexposed sunlight. So one of those little things that you might want to try to avoid, be careful with windows in space. Um, you see that little white curtain that's kind of floating up there? That's in fact the privacy curtain because KGB regulations say that they have to be able to see each other at all times. So even when they're sleeping, they can see, see the other guy's feet just in case he's doing God knows what. Um, this is a really wide angle lens, okay? And right, right here in front of us is the table. Um, 
On the table, a piece pops up that becomes the controls on the treadmill, which is right behind it. And over there in the corner between the treadmill and the norm is the toilet. Um, so, for example, you could be sitting there trying to eat while somebody is jogging, and of course the sweat's flooding, and then you may need to get up and get past that person to get to the toilet. There's not a lot of privacy. And the kind of stressors um, that can pretty easily build up, especially between very type A personality people, are basically already built in. Our challenge is to try to get them built out to begin with. Um, one of the most important problems in designing something, as I hope you've all come to the con understood, is the logistical issue of how you build it. How do you get your materials and your elements to the building site, and then how do you put them together? Both Mir and Skylab were delivered to orbit as individual module elements atop a rocket, which were either robotically or manually maneuvered together. But although the idea of a reusable space plane, which could bring people and cargo up and return them safely to a normal landing on the ground, has been around since the 1930s, when a guy named Eugen Zenger first proposed his project Silverbird, it was nearly another half century before the first space shuttle had her maiden voyage. Capable of carrying over 35,000 pounds of payload plus a seven-person crew into orbit and returning to a safe runway landing, the orbiter... By the way, did you know you could land a space shuttle at Chicago O'Hare Airport? One of those great little details that makes you sort of scratch your head. But anyway, it's a truly extraordinary machine, and the mid-deck is also used for extensive scientific experiments during almost every mission. Shuttle missions have provided us with breakthroughs not only in crystal, fluid, and gas science, but also with the complete revision within the last year of our understanding of the nature of the universe, thanks to its delivery and support of the Hubble and Chandra Space Telescopes. Furthermore, the shuttle is a truck. It's designed to transfer goods and people between Earth and space, and just as a semi is sized to pull a standard shipping container and vice versa, the shuttle's payload bay is sized to hold pressure shells up to 14 feet in outer diameter, or the largest cargo items that can be transported on the federal rail and highway system. It was designed this way in order to enable it to serve its primary function, which was construction and operational support of what was then to be the vast U.S. space station Freedom, and is today the International Space Station Alpha. As you know, there have been quite a few Millennium projects in the last couple of years, most of which aren't even there anymore. Um, undoubtedly, the most ambitious of those is the one that was started construction in 1999 at 250 statute miles above the Earth, the International Space Station. Already today, it's the third largest object in the night sky. And here you see it as it was in late 1999 with the Russian element Sadia orbiting joined to the U.S. node module Unity. From this juncture, both the Russian and U.S. segments are designed to grow to the full configuration that you see over here on the left. The ISS standard module was developed in the early 80s for space station freedom. One of the things that made it possible for this concept to be carried out by American, Italian, French, Japanese, Canadian, and even Brazilian partners, although at the time it was just going to be done by us, without a total design revision, is that it's highly rational, modularized design. There are only two module types, each of which has one basic dimension and common structural and mechanical connections. The virtue of this simple modular design concept shows particularly in the relative coherence of the ISS, despite the fact that all detailing and design development of individual racks and systems, and even the separate payloads within a single rack, is still performed entirely by completely disparate groups of engineers and specialists, without any regular reference to a central or cohesive program of design integration. Can you imagine how challenging this is to work with? Unfortunately, one thing we're also learning from the astronauts that have been, that were on Mir, is that one of the most critical problems in long duration space flight is a lack of adequate separation of functions. And of course, it's also going to prove to be a problem on Alpha. Over here you see, um, yeah, okay, their backs are turned, but that was the Expedition 1 crew, the original crew that first opened up the space station. Um, and at that point, they were still, of course, on the ground checking out one of the modules, the U.S. lab module that was um, being put together. And um, 
let's see. Uh, oh, the main problem, right. Um, when you have a can, a hard shell on the outside, the only direction that you have to move is inwards. So when you start with your somewhat less than 14 feet on the outside, and then you have to add systems, and you have to add payloads, and you have to add other functionality, what you end up with is a seven foot square corridor of open volume that runs through the entire vehicle, if you're lucky, if there's not extra stuff sticking in the middle of the corridor. So on the one hand, the space station is the greatest engineering project in history hands down. It's also, from a political and economic point of view, a really remarkable expenditure of money for peacetime purposes, something that has never happened before in human history on that kind of scale. Unfortunately, to live in, it's kind of like a big shotgun shack. Um, there's no privacy as you're looking along these corridors. Um, and this is going to contribute a great deal to stress. When you're doing work in one of these corridors and hanging out in there, and somebody goes, you know, brushes past you as they're moving from one area to another, and they brush past you seven times in a day, and they do this for six months, you know, it starts to tick you off. People really can't get away from each other. There's also not really enough room for people to face each other and hang out. Um, and and really spend time forming a good crew and group on a regular basis. And that is something that is absolutely going to have to change if we're going to go back to the moon, and especially if we're going to go to Mars. And considering the challenges of sending an extended human group to Mars, NASA is beginning to look at ways of closing the risk gap in the human system. On a camping trip, anyone can survive, even the harshest conditions. But as any flown astronaut will attest, even a short period in tight quarters can be very wearing, and a long period would result in an unacceptably high risk of stress among the crew. Community life, communication, and interaction among space voyagers are important considerations for space architecture. In recent years, we've had a chance to start working towards answers to these questions with advanced project teams and development of a one of them was called Bioplex, it's now called Integrity, um, and then there was the TransHab project, both of which are prototypes for Mars exploration. This is a great delay, it's really weird. Um, okay. Um, Bioplex was, um, uh, it, or Integrity, I'm sorry, um, is a ground-based uh, facility that's meant to serve as a prototype for a surface habitat on Mars. Um, and TransHab is meant to deal with the transit aspect of that, the transit habitat. Um, the Mars Design Reference Mission is a mission of about 800 days. And what we're looking at is six months out to Mars, about 425 days on the surface, and about six months home. Uh, according to um, their, okay, so on. Ah, there's various versions of this, and I've worked on um, a couple of them. So, but I'm going to give you um, the most likely version is that a robotically landed um, system, habitat, whatever it is, will first be sent to Mars. It will land. It will check out before we send the crew. Um, and then when they get there, they will be able to start up a bioregenerative life support system, um, which can keep them going actually pretty much indefinitely. However, on the way out, they will have suffered from muscular and skeletal deterioration, right? Um, unless they're shielded by pockets of water, basically. We've looked at all different kinds of materials, and water seems to be the best material for shielding against all different types of radiation. Um, but even with shielding, they will have been exposed to a lot of what we call galactic cosmic radiation. Isn't that a great word, galactic cosmic radiation? Um, which is basically the fallout of the Big Bang. It's a bunch of really big particles um, that are repelled from the Earth's vicinity by our magnetosphere, but basically out in, you know, beyond a magnetosphere, it's, it's everywhere. And Mars only has a, an atmosphere of about 30 bars, and it's got not a very good magnetosphere, so they're not very well shielded there either. Um, the planet is one half the size of Earth. There's only one third the gravity. There's no available oxygen, but we're working on technologies um, to extract oxygen, methane, and hydrogen from the Martian atmosphere. Actually, a robotic mission 
um, to test that is going to be set up in a couple of months. Temperatures range at the equator from about 15 degrees centigrade to about 130 degrees centigrade below zero. How is it possible to establish whether or not it's practical to send people um, and in what kind of environment? Integrity, as I said, is a test facility under development at the Johnson Space Center. Um, its configuration is really not optimal for a surface habitat, but it was um, you know, proposed quite a few years ago. Um, and so at least we can work with options in terms of how to use the volume inside and test how people respond to, uh, to different allocations of space. Some of the chambers are, two of the chambers are used for the production of food plants, which also, um, these are great, they have like dwarf peanut plants from George Washington Carver University and dwarf wheat from some place in Iowa. Um, you know, in this incredibly high-tech environment in which they're, you know, harvesting wheat and making grain and it's like some weird French radical syndicalist vision of the future. Um, they're also, um, there's a lab module that houses bacterial bioreactors, which are beautiful. They're these big clear columns of bugs and the water, you know, the wastewater goes trickling through there and it all gets cleaned and, and the bugs are happy and the people are happy and, you know, one of the great things um, that Bioplex, therefore, of course, has to offer us are great advances um, in sustainable technologies for use in our own homes or for use on an urban scale. Um, and unfortunately, you know, of course, not a lot of attention has been given to that aspect of it, but hopefully it will continue to get enough funding to get there. Um, it's also an opportunity for us to test social and group behavior inside these chambers, I mean, in a really limited volume. Because, you know, when I first came here to work, came there <laughs> to work on Bioplex, um, I said, okay, you know, what's the program? Well, program. You, you don't have, I mean, NASA hasn't really studied what the program of an enclosed habitat for four people for 400 days would be. No. I know, and that's, it's not like sitting, you know, at your, at your studio table at two o'clock in the morning and going, ah, party, you know, because people's lives depend on what you're giving them and what you're offering them in terms of how their volume is used. The exciting part is that it's an opportunity that nobody else really has had to quantify the relationship between those volumes and that allocation and, and um, and how people respond. So what I did, um, first of all, I set up a test um, in, a, in a previous test facility where I studied, um, I did video capture, and I studied over the period of several weeks how the crew used um, the rooms that were already allocated, the private space and the public space, and another public space that was generous but incredibly loud um, with lighting that shoots right into your eyes. And amazingly enough, that ladder volume was used not at all. Surprise. Um, but these are opportunities then to be able then to say, OK, on a quantitative basis, all right, these are things you may not do. Um, and you can't get away with it. People aren't going to use it. And that's what you have to do in a space program, but it's also useful to architecture. I designed the elements for Bioplex so that they can be reconfigured between tests. <laughs> and the first thing, of course, was you know, remember that it's a facility for testing systems. So the systems are going to grow, they're going to expand, they're going to do all kinds of different stuff. I realized the first thing I had to do was to create utility chases that were built in, the understanding being that they were going to grow. The systems were going to proliferate, they were going to change, people were going to need to get in there and shift things around. Um, so I actually call this model the visible can. Um, because the whole idea was, okay, we have no idea where things are going to need to be, so let's just create a system um, of supplying, um, you know, nerves, blood vessels, or electrical lines, um, water lines, air lines, and um, keeping it out of, out of any possible place of conflict um, for any other systems. And then design the interior um, subsidiary structures to kind of gel with that idea and to support it. Um, 
and then design the floor plans so that um, individual elements could be reconfigured. Um, and here you have the upper floor, sort of the biggest test between um, two different long duration tests. We would shift the upper floor so that you had either, um, you know, okay, modest private rooms and a kind of secondary social space um, or pretty good sized private rooms. Um, and then the only real social space would be on the ground floor. So it's you know, one way of, of taking a look at how people fare when they've got different amounts of, um, of private versus public space. At the same time that we've been developing a technology in the program for an off-Earth planetary habitat in Bioplex slash integrity, we're also looking towards technologies that will suit the transit habitat or transhab. The ISS TransHab is the first human-rated inflatable spacecraft in history. It's a prototype for the Mars Transit Vehicle, which was developed for between 1997 and 2001, and also as a possible addition to the International Space Station as the crew's hab module. In order to address the myriad challenges of supporting humans on such a long journey within the constraints of size and mass, a vehicle was conceived which is revolutionary in several ways. First of all, TransHab is a dual system typology which relies on cutting edge developments both in fabrics and in composite materials to allow us to join the inflatable outer shell to a light yet robust core structure. Basically, when I'm talking about this typology, the best um, analogy is to evolutionary biology and the revolution in biological form that came with the move from an, from an exoskeletal typology to an endoskeletal one. In other words, the first creatures have no skeleton and they can only grow to a certain size before they become unviable. Then you have mollusks, um, insects, anything with a hard outer shell which is also its main structure. Um, and they're also limited of course in form in certain ways. The big revolution happens when the structure is differentiated and separated from the outer form. And from that point forward, anything is possible in terms of shape. Uh, Transhab is the first endoskeletal spacecraft. The problems of dealing with supporting the, the pressure differential between a pressurized environment and the vacuum of outer space is separated from the issue of the structure of the vehicle. Um, so that load um, is taken care of in one way, pressure is taken care of in another, and suddenly you have the capacity to expand the vehicle. Um, so it needs to be small, of course, when it's in the space shuttle, but we need as much volume as possible in outer space. Something, oh, yeah, there you go, there's the shell. Um, inflatable technologies have been discussed for space applications for a long time because of their low weight. In fact, uh, the Soviets tried an inflatable airlock in the late 60s, um, and there's this cosmonaut, Alexei Leonov, who has survived more uh, design disasters in the Soviet program than, than anybody else I've ever heard of. And he also managed not to be killed by this airlock, but it was a miracle. Um, the main problem is, was of course, you know, here you have an inflatable technology, but it didn't have a rigid structure. Um, also, the materials that we had to create the inflatable shells weren't really robust enough. Transhab managed to marry the new highly durable inflatables um, based on a basically a basket weave, a perfect basket weave, the oldest human technology, um, with a kind of hard structure in a very light graphite composite, and that was the real breakthrough. The other thing that made TransHab completely unique in the history of spacecraft design was that from the very beginning, this technological proposition was married with a concern about the needs of the human occupants. So it was sized to to, to suit the people that it was going to be serving. A series of studies on paper and in mock-ups were performed with astronaut participation in order to determine what would be the best possible utilization for the vehicle, including human requirements for restraint and mobility and microgravity and a maintenance of a constant vertical orientation with the kind of layout that would help a diverse crew live and work together. They would have privacy, um, they would have discrete areas so that you could be doing your job without somebody floating around behind you or in front of you the whole time. And 
The great thing you get to do at NASA is that you can build something in a one-to-one -one scale and let people walk through it and go, hmm, you know, this, this really isn't such a good idea. Um, <laughs> which is, you know, you don't often have that kind of opportunity, so that's nice. Um, what we ended up with was a three-floor three split-level plan with the exercise, personal hygiene, and sick bay areas on the upper floor. In the middle of the torus, there's a kind of half level, um, which is occupied by an enclosed mechanical room. And the central portion of the core that you see there in the middle, um, first of all, that portion is bounded by 10 centimeter thick water tanks that basically form a radiation shield around the center part. Um, these were sized to serve as a safe haven for the crew during the worst solar particle event that we've yet recorded in history. So if, for example, they were up there on the station and the sun started to act up, the whole crew could go inside there for a week and be completely safe. Um, what this also does is, since they're sleeping inside there and it's their personal quarters, um, if they're on their way to Mars, for example, one third of every day, they're being completely shielded from whatever particles there might be out there. Um, and radiation dosage is kind of a numbers game. I mean, it's basically about cumulative exposure for the most part. The other way, by the way, that TransHab protects them from radiation is that um, when large particles hit metal, they tend to break off into secondary particles, kind of like the principle behind a cluster bomb. And um, TransHab has no metal in its outer shell or outer core, unlike, yes, any other spacecraft out there. So um, that's another major issue there. Let's see. On the lower level, then, you have a double-story high space around the wardroom, um, and you can seat a crew of up to 12 people. And then in the core, um, you have galley functions. These sort of blocky things were um, space station racks that were able to accommodate and trans-have. Of course, we'd rather not have to do it that way, but the program made us, you know, gave us the challenge of seeing if we could do it, and so we worked that one out. Basically, as you can see, the core is what's carrying all of the systems, all of the utilities, and everything sort of plugs into that, but then you use the volume around the outside of the core for your discrete use, use areas. And there, okay, there you have the galley area, the wardroom table. There's a bunch of mere astronauts hanging out and going like, oh, yeah, this would look really good. We like that. It's a fun job, you know, I mean, it's crazy, but um, the key and the trick to TransHab was making it work in two different configurations. One configuration um, was the one that's most critical in terms of structure, but it only lasts for seven minutes of the lifetime of the vehicle, um, which is the launch configuration, and that's where the whole core structure has to take up to seven Gs of loading in any possible direction. It's kind of like seismic design to the max. Um, and then you have to be able to deploy all of those pieces of structure. So there it is in its launch configuration. There's the shell is folded up around the core. And um, this is our test article, our full-scale test article inside the big vacuum chamber at the Johnson Space Center. That door is the largest single hinged door in the world. And I'll have you know that a single person can push it closed. That was when we had German engineers, and boy, they did some slick work. Um, every American uh, human spacecraft was um, vacuum tested and thermal tested inside that chamber. And there's some really, and including um, EVA suits, um, were tested inside that chamber. So that door is about, uh, I think about eight meters in diameter. I mean, it's, it's really, really pretty cool. Um, so that's the launch configuration. And then, of course, on orbit, it inflates. As the shell inflates, a series of, of struts that are protecting the stuff inside that core unfold kind of like umbrella struts. And then you get these, what we, I mean, we're calling them floors, but they're really just you know, lateral partitions that divide up the use spaces and break up the acoustics and the functionality. The trick is, of course, you need a lot of stuff out here and you know, in the finished sequence and during the launch, you need a lot of stuff in here to take all of the weight. So you can sort of see where we were going with this sort of transformer idea. The trick though is, it's kind of like getting your whole house inside a container with just one IKEA sheet 
uh, and three different tools um, to take all of these pieces and put it together. So we've designed the core structure so that um, most of the um, various pieces like light switches, uh, fire extinguishers, mechanical equipment are located inside the core at launch on the shelf um, that they want to be on in their final assembly. And part of, I mean, we were constantly having to revise that and check it as we, as we ran through the choreography of the assembly sequence. We're looking at about a month's worth of work on the part of seven astronauts putting this thing together without gravity. So it was a pretty exciting um, kind of problem. Then we had subsidiary structures. Um, this is a stowage array. Um, we can accommodate up to 800 cubic feet of stowed items, which is actually twice as much as the entire International Space Station would be able to accommodate without TransHab. Um, but these structures are also designed to keep items away from the shell um, because it's up against the edges of things that water likes to collect. For example, you get condensation. And ended up forming a kind of plenum, plenum wall for the air. So the air system, the air is then delivered at these rings at the top and bottom of the core outward and then is sort of sucked half, almost passively around the back of this array back into the plenum, back into the mechanical room. What we were able to do by designing it that way was to save one third of the equipment that would otherwise have been needed um, to move the air around a volume that big, much to the astonishment of the, uh, of the thermal team. So, um, and this is just, you know, one model of one early approach to, to how something like that would be built in a very light way. We have, um, the structures team, as I said, has uh, several patents already on this process. They built full-scale mock-ups of, um, of the, the structural part of the shell and um, tried to fail it. The test engineers, you know, test engineers love to blow things up. I mean, that's what their whole vocation is. And they're really annoyed by TransHab because they never did yet manage to fail it. In trying to fail TransHab, they actually broke their own test gurneys, which was which we're very proud of, but it didn't win us a lot of friends in the test engineering world. Um, that's the team right there. Um, this was an early prototype, and I remember, I mean, it's one of those, you know, I'm sort of watching the engineers working on this stuff, and I'm thinking, gosh, you know, if this were a basket, I know that it would split right between those big fat pieces of webbing, but what do I know about all of this? And guess what? That's where it split. So one of the things that we are trained in as architects which is an understanding of paradigms and applying paradigms. Here we go back to the making it new part. Um, applying ancient paradigms when appropriate to new applications gets us ahead of the game. And it's something, you know, it's a really, really important aspect of our training here to have as much general knowledge as possible. Do not ever try to be an absolute expert in any one of these things because it's going to drag your attention away from your job as an architect, which is to be the person on the team who knows more or less what everybody else on the team has as their central goal, what their needs and requirements are, and who respects that. By creating that atmosphere of respect in a project team, um, you can really make a huge difference in terms of what is achieved. Um, I guess, are we ready yet for, um, yeah, this is it, so uh, we're ready for the video. Oh, no, there's the full scale version in the vacuum chamber. Um, this is a shield. We also invented a way of repelling orbital debris. This stuff is coming at you at the speed of a, uh, the bullet from a high-speed rifle. And um, what they did was find ways basically of separating layers of Kevlar with foam so that um, the particles destroy themselves through their own shock waves as they try to travel through the shell. Um, and so, in fact, this fabric thing um, is much more robust than one of the hard-shelled modules, which once again does not win us a lot of friends in certain places, but makes us very pleased with ourselves. Um, I think that's it for the slides. Okay, we've got a little 
groovy fly through animation video and the great tech people are going to get us set up here. I'll turn this off. This actually was done by a guy who, uh, who started off his career working in La Raymond Lowy's office on Skylab. His transat being pulled at record speed out of the space shuttle's cargo bay and uh, really slapped onto the space station. Yeah, but you have to bear with his little artistic license. Now, as it's inflating, more struts are being released, right, and they're unfolding and clicking into place now that it's at its full diameter. We're coming in over the wardroom table here and moving into the central galley area. Um, looking up now near the crew quarters, you see, for example, up there in the wall, a light fixture um, sort of embedded in the wall. This is one of the technologies developed in-house at Lockheed Martin that I helped to develop um, that I call an exploration class technology. In other words, these particular light fixtures can be kicked, they can be hit, they last for 11 years without requiring to be changed out. Um, and they're now beginning to trickle into the um, to general market in terms of other applications, but we developed it for TransHab. This is the exercise area and a, a very brawny female astronaut model. Um, that's the sort of, uh, here's the, an area that would um, be the private medical compartment if people needed to talk to their doctor for whatever reason. Um, now we're coming down the main translation path into the wardroom. Um, I made my note about Frazzanito being a lowy guy because he actually changed the dimensions on the restraints for my table. Um, and you can see that the table still hits the astronaut somewhere around the hip level, which was a little annoying to me because I had actually fixed that problem, but that's <clears throat> probably not something I should be sharing with you at this point in time. I did develop um, a method of restraint, though, that's pretty much universal. People of any size can park themselves anywhere around that table and more or less remain in place in a pretty comfortable way. Um, if you ever get to see some of the restraints they use in the space program, you'll see how unusual that is. This is um, basically just space for stowed items. If you're going to spend six months going to Mars, you're going to need a lot of stuff. And here we are then looking back up along the core of the transhab. That would be your basic structure there. That's it. Um, so in the interplay of interior and exterior structures with water and air recycling, the interlocking functions of its use, transhab was designed not just metaphorically, but pretty much literally as a living exoskeleton for its crew. It's both habitat and ecosystem. It deploys like a sort of floral organism, and it cycles water and air like a kind of fauna. In essence, in space architecture, what we're trying to do is to emulate our own structures or the structures of nature in order to shield and support the very few and very lucky people that we're sending out into the solar system. In this work, we're making a lot of important advances, but the not least among them is the development of a methodology for architects to work more closely with engineers at the front edge of emerging technologies. We're working on harmonizing subsystems, doing things that they call things like configuration control um, in order to maintain architectural integration of the vehicle, um, but also to get involved in a dynamic process it's hoped that these kinds of projects and other facilities may help also to quantify the minimum human needs in constrained environments and subsequently design ways of sustaining crew comfort and reducing risks inherent in sending people on a long mission off planet. It's amazing how much we stand to learn about ourselves in the process, not just as humans, but as architects in a profession. Best of all, this practice has taught me really what it is that an architect does, and it challenges me to work on something somewhat beyond the edges of my dreams. Architecture is the process of resolving the interfaces between unrelated systems toward the goal of unifying them in a single functional element. Or, architecture is the process of turning the chaos which exists into the harmony which we desire. Or, 
architecture is the vocation of reconciling reality with dreams. The Odyssey of Space Architecture is an investment in the future that I want to see, a future in which people use their technologies to help them live lightly, fairly, and well, and in which they derive their structures from the balance of nature's patterns. People who can control their interactions with their world are also people who can choose how they will interact with one another. When we have a vision, we don't have time for terror. Architecture involves forging harmony around the human system, balancing culture, biology, planetary knowledge, and technology in counterpoint to the unknowable. Knowledge and techniques derived from the practice of space architecture can improve the sustained quality of life on our human mothership, the Earth. So my challenge to you today and always is reflect on yourself, on your practice. Consider, if you will, the idea of lifting your sights so that we may all dream together of the world that we want to have. Let us picture our grandchildren, equal and enfranchised, sailing in comfortable chic past the moons of Mars. Thank you. some light. <clears throat> I'm happy you're taking questions when there's light in the room. Is there a way of doing that? Before everyone escapes? <laughs> ah. Hi, okay, I don't know what our time plan is like, but Um, well, as you may know, it's an idea, sorry, the question, what happened to the idea of generating artificial gravity by spinning the vehicle? It is such a huge, huge question, and of course it's one that always, always comes up, and I have yet to come up with a really good, clean answer, but I'll do my best. First of all, um, the idea, for example, of the spinning space station, as you may know, was first um, developed by a guy named Tsiolkovsky in 1898. Uh, the version of it that we know was really, was really refined by von Braun in the 50s. Um, and even then, it was pretty well understood that something like that, in order to work for human purposes um, and not really mess with the vestibular system, would have to be 250 meters in diameter and travel at a rate of two revolutions per minute, which the cost of developing something like that is so prohibitive, we're not even close to thinking about how to test it. The idea is a really, really good one. Obviously, it's on the top of the list of sort of dream goals for the space program. Um, but um, it actually, there was one shuttle flight that attempted to uh, fly a counterweight and a tether um, and spin the shuttle, and, and it broke. You know, the structural issues in making something like that work are, are not small and you may end up running across one or another you know group um, saying oh we've developed you know we can do this thing we'll just do some sh some tethers and then we'll spin it and um, I would caution you not you know to be a little bit careful about what you think of those projects um, finally the main reason that anybody ha that we have a space program today is to have no gravity. The whole space station is for the purpose of flying science payloads that allow us breakthroughs because they're off Earth. There's no gravity. So the artificial gravity idea may be a convenient one for people, but for the time being, um, it's actually absolutely in contradiction to um, the main goals of the space program in general. So there's a bunch of stuff going on about that question, but it's always a good place to start. Um, is that, and I can answer, I can talk about it a lot more if, offline if you want, but, yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, well, we're not going to see proposals for anything about the appearance of anything for a long time. The word appearance, I mean, and I'm, I'm not making light of your question. Um, that really is a serious... Yes, I agree, believe me. Um, but basically the only way, I mean, you may, you know, you may have found my language um, a little alienating in its, in its sort of technical nature, but um, it's, it's part of the point is that we're, you know, we're not running this show. The architects, the few architects who are working in, you know, the space program or some part of it um, will basically spend all of our lives and careers, if we're lucky, working on finding ways of convincing engineers why we're useful to them. Um, which is an interesting act of humility for an architect, um, you know, not being the one in the position of firing the engineer. Um, natural looking materials. Problem, another problem with materials, which is really tough, is that they must both not off-gas, which cuts out a huge number of the materials that are available, and basically be non-flammable, which, you know, then the subset of materials that don't do one or the other is incredibly small, and they must be light. So, you know, if we can just come up with good usable materials that fit those criteria to begin with, um, that's a big start. And, I mean, the idea, one, um, I had a really interesting time uh, working with Kent Bloomer, who's an ornament professor at Yale. I had his studio um, try to develop, using um, the colors of Nomex fiber that DuPont produces. Nomex has been completely tested as a, and it's a fabric that's much used in the space program just because it's been approved. Um, coming up with flat patterns, basically weaving patterns, using those existing colors for the shell on the inside lining of Transhab to see about developing basically, you know, types of ornament for a no-gravity environment um, to help people. And the, the responses were really, really interesting. The class worked really, really hard. There was some great work. And some people focused more on questions about um, using pattern to help the crew with orientation. And other, and other groups worked on ideas about, um, about nature and bringing that into you know, the spacecraft environment. That's, that's as close as, as anything I've seen um, has, has come in a convincing kind of way. And, you know, so we're just, uh, we're still at least a generation away from really addressing that question, but it's always there. Um, what else? No other questions? You're kidding me. I must have put you all to sleep. Well, it's actually one of the, the cool things about working in the space program is how, um, is the group of people that you work with. You know, I'm working with people who are such total geeks and, and, and they're, they're completely, you know, they really are, they believe that, that, that we're going to go to Mars. And, you know, they're true believers. At the same time, these are people, you know, whose, whose life blood, whose heart and dream um, is always on the congressional pork barrel list. And, you know, the Bioplex team, the pe first people I really got to know working there, um, are these great, nice people, and their project has been killed over and over and over and over again. And it is such an enormous project in the history of science. It is incredibly complicated and really valuable, the stuff that they're working on, and yet, you know, obscure from the point of view of enough of the world that, you know, it's a miracle that they're still there and they're still trying. So. Um, I guess it's an unfortunate part of that world. There's, you know, if you, if you can't develop a certain cynical edge, then you really just can't keep going. And yet, 
you have to be enthusiastic too, and that's true for architecture too. You know, it's a pretty tough road to hoe. So, I don't know. Anything else? No. Yes. Hi. That would be really nice if that were the case, but of course um, there are so many different interests involved in any program um, that there are a lot of defined goals. And of course there are always a few of them that are short term and political, otherwise you don't get funded and you don't have a program. Um, and you know, I mean, that's often true of architecture in general, you know, of, of many projects. Um, so, but I mean, <clears throat> One of the programs, one of the things I've been working on is, uh, you know, the sort of ongoing, constantly redefined um, attempt to design whatever it is that will replace the space shuttle. And, you know, the last time around, there were 30 different types of mission that this thing was supposed to you know, respond to because all of the different people got him and the Department of Defense came in with a few things they wanted, to, you know, this thing to do and NASA has 20 different things they wanted to do. And you, you can't design anything that does 30 different things. Um, so, I mean, that's, you know, a clear definition of the goals is kind of a holy grail uh, for the space program. It's something that you would like. In a way, though, um, once again, the training of architecture is very useful because, you know, when you're handed a studio project at the beginning of a year or any competition, you know, there's always a number of ways of responding to anything. And, and part of your job as an architect is to narrow and define the goals and say, okay, this design, <coughs> excuse me, serves these purposes and responds to these goals. And, you know, Maybe it's better than one that responds to different goals. Um, and that's, you know, another contribution to, um, you know, to this kind of program that architecture really, really can bring. Are we done? Well, wow. oh. overlap with the chief engineer a lot. Um, I mean, maybe in terms of ego it does, but, um, but properly understood, um, it's really nice to have a chief engineer and a vehicle architect and a systems engineer. Um, so that these people can all focus on their areas and just agree to collaborate. Um, and we, we basically had that on TransHab. One of the things that I think helped make TransHab work was that at the core of the team, there were two architects, which is, you know, just never happened before. And um, Chris Kennedy, who was the other architect, um, has actually been working for NASA for 12 years now um, and as a systems engineer, principally. And so his job was systems integration engineering, and my job was vehicle architecture and crew systems. And, and so, you know, back to back, we, we made one project architect. Um, and then the chief engineer was an engineer, and sometimes we got along great, and sometimes we were at one another's throats. Um, but um, basically, you know, if the chief engineer is, is coordinating all of, the, um, all of the engineering systems as they develop, and um, the systems integration is about making them work together, right, as opposed to individual coordination by the chief engineer. 
Um, and the vehicle architect is saying, how does the physical manifestation of all of these integrated systems as they develop um, evolve? You know, are there issues there? That's kind of the relationship between the three as they would work. I don't know if what I've just said makes any sense to someone that hasn't worked in this kind of program. It's difficult sometimes to translate, but um, that's the best stab I can take off the bat. It's a great question. It's a really important question. Are we good? For now? Okay. Thanks very much.